What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being I'm built. joined today with Yaden Smith. Yes, it's pronounced Yaden. How you doing, Yaden? I'm doing real well, Dan. It's easy to remember in the real estate space at the closing table. Yay, done. Yay, there you go. Done. Right, yay. exactly. <laughs> I just remembered the yay because it's like such a celebration. It's fantastic. And I've got lots of reason to celebrate. After all, I've got my very favorite audience member right here. And why is my favorite audience member here? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate investors. Why do I do that? Well, you need to know the other people who are in your industry to see if there's any overlap. And it really helps that it's the law too. When you're talking about people who are syndicators, investors, and all that kind of stuff. But before we get too excited about the different roles and the motivations that we're trying to find out, uh, Yaden, can you please uh, introduce yourself a little bit to the uh, audience? Sure, Dan. So Yaden Smith, I'm based out of Charleston, South Carolina. I, I do full-time multifamily syndication and we've actually built a whole education platform from that with people just asking us how we got started. So today, actually, while we're talking, I might, I might look at my phone once or twice because we are closing the refinance of our biggest deal so far today. Nice. Today is refinance closing. I went live earlier going through the numbers, but so that's what we do. We do multifamily syndication and we have education and mentoring and accountability on how to do that, how to do what we do. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I've been watching you. You've been putting out some great stuff. But the first question I have for you right over here, and then I hit that, and then I hit this, and then I make it pop up on the screen right there. Fill in this blank, if you will. There are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. <laughs> what do you think is too risky for you? Unpopular opinion. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be very, very careful how I, how I explain this, but the stock market stocks that do not pay dividends, I think are too risky. Now, if you have a stock that's paying you, you know, three or 4%, whatever, paying you a couple bucks per share, whatever, whatever that looks like, it's like, Hey, you got a cash flowing asset at that point. Uh, it doesn't matter whether somebody else thinks it's more valuable or less valuable, but you buy a stock that does not send out dividends. The only way you make money is the next person in line thinks that share of stock is m worth more than what you paid for it and mm -hmm. on and on and on. You know, uh, I know Tesla is like one of the only car companies that's been founded in the past 50 years, but for a long time, they weren't making any profit. I still don't know if they're actually making a profit. I also mm -hmm. know they're not really sending out distributions of whatever profit they have, you know, so having stocks that do not send you money on the regular, I think that's too risky because you're just betting that someone else is going to think it's worth more a year from now. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I completely agree. You know, it, it's same for Pokemon cards and Air Jordans. It doesn't pay you to own it, right? But or uh, the uh, Beanie Babies from Beanie when Babies. I was growing up. <laughs> right. Yeah, beanie babies. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So the next segment that I have here has to do with motivation. There's five distinct motivations I've found that really separate commercial investors. And I like to find that out first because sometimes I have newbies on the show and they know why they're jumping in, but they don't know what role they're going to be uh, performing. And we'll get that into a minute. So we'll do this first. The first motivation I found some commercial investors have, why they, or they're making more uh, acquisitions is because they're trying to preserve the purchasing power. Now, if you already have enough assets, cash flowing assets to make your ends meet, that's really the ultimate goal as far as uh, uh, having assets and doing a lot of this stuff in the first place. But if inflation rears its ugly head, then the cash flow from those assets aren't going to be enough. And the only fix is to make another acquisition. So that's why some people are making acquisitions, but that's not me. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to trade time directly for wealth. I've got a background in tech, specifically it's in CRMs. I own a CRM agency and I've been helping all sorts of seven figure online businesses for about 12 years. But the problem with making a bunch of money is in the form of salary or wage is you're paying more tax than anybody else. So that I put the on most my most heavily taxed yeah. money there is. 
Exactly, yep. exactly. So so that's why I was going like, all right, well, if the name of the game is to multiply uh, equity in, you know, in that form of uh, illiquid, illiquid capital, then you might as well focus on that and back off on the uh, on the straight income due to wage or whatever. That's what I'm up to. But a lot of people, they get into this because they're either looking to open the door to uh, retirement one day, or, you know, maybe they want to do it early. But really, this piece here of fast track and retirement, whatever, I really mean is some people are looking to take back their time. They want to work fewer months per year, maybe it's fewer weeks per uh, per month or fewer hours per week. But regardless, it's they want to get their time back. And that's different from some commercial investors I run into who are super duper ambitious. Those guys want to buy their entire hometown. They want to get that generational wealth. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold down a day job. So they're just keeping they're just making acquisitions left right and center for that reason and that's great because they're going to hustle into their 90s basically until they until they drop (laughs) just like the last group i like to say they're trying to save the world but more specifically these people they found uh, either a sector of society or maybe it's the environment or maybe maybe it's animals maybe they want to send people to space who knows what it is but they realize you need to have that financial backing to to make a really big impact on society and that's why they're doing these so so as far as you, Yaden, uh, what combination of those motivations or which ones really stand out and resonate and describe you best? Wow. So short answer, all. Mm-hmm. More complicated answer, still all with an explanation. Like that last one that you said, impacting the world. I, I, I used to be in youth ministry. And before that, I was on the mission field. I raised money. Uh, you know, I asked people to donate. M- money is the muscle of ministry whether it's religious affiliated or not, it doesn't matter. It it takes money to run nonprofit, charitable, impacting organizations. And that's huge. We actually have on our Smith family budget that my Google sheet, we have a waiting list of organizations that I'm excited to contribute to. And it motivates me to generate more revenue so I can get them off the waiting list and onto the giving list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But fast track retirement, With what I've done just in the past three years, I don't have to do anything else for my retirement. These cash flowing assets that we've built, that we've that we've acquired, that we've you know stabilized and and turned around. Yeah, it's gonna take time, but in by the time I would be retirement age, they'll be spitting off, you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars a month. And my retirement is done if all I do is make sixty thousand dollars a year for the next 20 years as a store manager somewhere, I'll be good to go. Um, Let's see, tax advantages. Oh my gosh, don't even get me started on the tax benefits of commercial real estate. Working as a real estate professional, which is a category in the tax code, the, the depreciation factor for commercial real estate is unreal. The government tells you where to invest your money. They do it through the tax code. And if you follow what they tell you to do, for the tax benefits, you can reduce your tax liability to even negative, uh, negative tax liability that you can carry forward for years when you when you may need it. Uh, the 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 ambition. I don't want everybody to know my name, but I want everyone to know the names of the organizations that we're going to support in our community. And you know the philanthropic foundation, like that's the Jessica Smith Foundation that supports all these nonprofits in the local area that's making Somerville a better place. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, you know, all of those, it's it's a piece from all of those that Mm -hmm. really motivates me for my children to have generational legacy assets that they can do. Um, You're talking about inflation, rent follows inflation. If you have a commercial real estate asset, as costs go up, guess what else goes up? Rent. So I don't want to say it's recession proof, mm. but it's, re- uh, it's, it's, it's inflation. It's inflation resistant because it tracks with inflation, right? It's like gas prices go up, rent goes up, my income goes up. I can pay for the gas. It's more expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a combination of all of those. I know when someone gets started in this industry, usually it's, it's one or two. Mm-hmm. But as people expand and grow, they realize, oh, there's only so many dollar bills you can spend in a month, even with a family of six. Beyond that, there's only so many 
I, I don't want to have $5 million in my bank account. I want to have $5 million of impact into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. What an awesome answer. So the next part is to talk about what you actually do in the deals. And to do that, I'm going to go, I'm going to use the dandoesdeals.com commercial roll die. You can get your own copy for free. I don't even ask for your email address, which in the history of marketing, that's the stupidest idea you can possibly do. You should always <laughs> at least ask for that. But the reason why I make sure it's totally free is because I want you to download it and print it out practice explaining this stuff because if you are going to be in commercial real estate your ability to effectively communicate is going to make the difference between it working out or not so i'm going to go through all Loading six up dan does deals right now so i can download that download and print Sweet. there we go so and while we're forget. at it yeah, exactly. While we're at it, let's talk about the different roles here. I got crazy glare going on here, so I can't really see the, uh, okay. oh, there, okay. we, there yeah. we go. Yeah. So we got a bunch of different properties and a bunch of paperwork here for a repositioner. And the story of a repositioner is they're looking at all this paperwork. They're an acquisitions person. So they're picking up the actual properties. They're interacting with sellers. But the first thing they're going to need to do, there's a fancy word for it. It's called underwriting. And that means doing the math. First of all, like, what are they doing the math for? They're figuring out, does this property even make the amount of money that the seller claims it is. And then after they end up doing all that math, the repositioning part of the term, it has to do with they're going to need to make some changes to find some upside. Now, what kind of upside can a repositioner get? Well, there's three main tools in their tool belt to pull off some upside. The first one is fairly simple. You know, financiers are people who deal with just paper and money and nothing else. But if you have more advantageous lending, that's upside. That's a slam dunk. Not everybody can do that. You need a pretty good history to pull that off. So the more obvious way first is is the operations piece. You stop those Benjamins from going down the toilet. But of course, there's much more to operations than just unclogging toilet, toilets and mowing lawns. And if you're up here in Canada, it's shoveling snow or whatever. But me personally, my background because of marketing and tech, one of the things like marketing uh, for the operations piece is to keep the vacancy rate low. So that's one thing I'm offering my GP teams along with the automation that comes from having an actual programmer. But operations these days, that's not enough to get the enough uh, upside for most repositioners. So they end up having to get a contractor team in there. They need the guys to upgrade the units because the upside they get then is then they can get new tenants and charge more because it's a nicer place. So they get the contractor team in there. But if the repositioner has the same problem that I have, which is I'm from the internet. So I need a local. I need some boots on the ground, somebody who can be there or in, in an hour or two. Because if I had to be there in an hour or two, I'd still be messing around at the airport in a couple hours. So you need somebody to keep an eye on that contractor team, make sure they're not cutting corners, keep an eye on the operations, making sure they're actually doing their job, they're not sloughing their photos or whatever else. And that seems to be the ownership team. But when the repositioner turns around to the financier and says, hey, I've got this enormous complex that I want to pick up. It's like 350 units or something like that. And it's tens of millions of dollars. So financiers, do you happen to have say tens of millions of dollars you can lend me? Well, they're going to want to know one other thing that I haven't mentioned yet, which is dun, 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 who's your KP? Who's your big sponsor? Mm -hmm. And what's that all about? Well, to be eligible for the loan, you have to have somebody in the fold who already owns a similar asset. So even if your name is Elon Musk, if you want to be eligible for a loan for a 350 unit apartment complex, somebody in the fold has to already own one. You also have to have a certain amount of liquidity. And then between the partnership team, you have to have a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So, Yaden, uh, where do you fit in? I know you have uh, some repositioner duties and I'm, you're probably KPing uh, uh, by now, but uh, why, don't, uh, why don't you tell everybody uh, what your contribution is? So I, I love that cube and I, I'm going to start, I'm going to start using it as, you know, a teaching tool in our, in our deal room with us. It's like, Hey guys, because we talk about the three pillars that you have to have. You have to have the property, the mm -hmm. deal, you got to have the investors and you mm -hmm. got to have the loan sponsor. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those three, you do not have a deal. Like right. that. So I, I love this. This, this fleshes out a little bit more. What, what I do, how I got started was a uh, repositioner. My background was residential real estate brokerage. And when I partnered up with my cousin Jennings to do property management, 
then we is like, well, let's study some on buying apartments and tell people we buy apartments. So I started out with analyzing deals and I'm embarrassed at how terrible my first analyzing spreadsheet was. I look at it now, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we survived with, with how, how simple and unsophisticated this is. But it really is digging into the numbers and understanding where the property is, understanding what the property's potential is and how much it's going to cost to get there and what that delta is, uh, if, if, it'll, if it'll work. And, and can it cover the spread? Can it, can it pay for itself along the way? Or do you have to have a war chest of $500,000 to pay the bills until you bumped up, you forced the appreciation up? Uh, and now also moved into the operations side where asset management, working with the property management company, uh, making sure that uh, the KPIs that we have for the different properties are, are we're, we're hitting them, whether it's for uh, marketing, occupancy, vacancy, you know, staying, staying on top of the contractor with draws for construction and renovation. So started with repositioning, now uh, a little bit of everything. And I, I am a loan guarantor on all of our stuff so far. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've even done some, some loan sponsoring of stuff that's not our stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like what you said, to, to be a loan sponsor, you got to prove to the bank you don't need the loan. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's it's so like, funny. oh, $30 million loan. You have $30 million and $3 million in the bank. Yep, you're good for it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's funny. I, I actually didn't know that Jennings was your cousin. For some reason, I thought he was your uh, was your brother, but uh, that, that's an interesting- that's, that's people, people think we're brothers. Yeah. And, and funny story, when we started our property management company, we did a little party get together and we invited everybody to it. You know, come to this party. We're kicking off this company, Jennings and Yaden Smith. Yeah. And my wife pointed out, you guys have to use your last name each. Mm -hmm. You can't right. just say you're cordially invited to a party Sincerely, Jennings and Yaden Smith. It looks like y'all are a couple. Couple. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. oh, I did not see that coming. So now it's like Jennings and Yaden, or Jennings Smith and Yaden Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So the next thing that I have to ask you though is about your ideal property. And so when ideal commercial property. investors are talking to each other about a buy box or ideal property, there are three main things they're talking about. First thing's geography, okay? So what states are you interested in? What counties, what neighborhoods even possibly? That all matters. They say location, 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 even though I don't like that saying because it has more to do with traffic than anything else. But that geography is the first thing. The second one that's super important is the size of the deal. And we're talking about multifamily here. And multifamily is the same as mobile home parks, self-storage, uh, also offices, things like that in the sense that unit count is how we distinguish the size of the deal. But if you're in industrial or warehousing, then it's gonna be square footage. So you need the geography, you need the uh, the size, in other words, the unit count. And then the third one is class. But of course, unfortunately, they use the same word for two different things. The first meaning of class is the actual condition of the building. So is it old and beat up or is it brand new and immaculate? And you know, what about the luxuries? Does it have all sorts mm -hmm. of amazing amenities or whatever? That's the first meaning of class. The second meaning of class, it has to do with the location of the property in respect to what's the crime rate like, what are the school districts like, and right. both of those are rated the, the same system, just like in grade school, uh, which is like, you know, like C plus, B minus, you know, that sort of thing, A minus and so on. So, uh, Yaden, as far as a property where if somebody's showing up, like let's say a seller or something like that. Uh, what is easier for you to say yes to and more difficult to say no to? So location is we focus on states that you would categorize as landlord friendly states, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. right now is kind of in the Sun Belt, Southwest, the South. We have we love Oklahoma. We love South Carolina, our home state. We love Georgia, North Carolina. We have stuff in South Carolina, Georgia, Oklahoma, and Illinois. Illinois taxes are whoo, brutal, brutal up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the locations that we focus on. We specifically like Tulsa. Tulsa, love Tulsa. Tulsa market is great. Unit count, unit count. We're we're we don't focus so much on it. Has to have a minimum unit count because some of our best deals are less than 50 units mm -hmm. and they're just spitting out money left and right. 
Mm -hmm. um, the key with units, unit count, if it's not big enough to support full-time staff, you just have to make sure that the property management company that you're working with can handle that without having somebody full-time on staff. For the, uh, what was it? What was the third thing? Yeah, the, uh, the class was- uh, The class, so, right, the yeah. class. So we focus, we don't focus on the class of building because that can be changed easily. You do renovations and you can take a C minus to an A. Well, maybe not A plus. I would categorize that as new construction. But mm -hmm. a we focus on class B or better areas. Mm -hmm. And by class B, we mean internally class A. Everybody wants to live there. It has all the amenities close to the beach, close to the river, close to whatever. Class B still got good schools, good jobs. You know, you don't have a horrible commute. And most people would be like, yeah, this is a nice place to live. Class C would be like, mm, I'm not sure I want to hang out here after dark. Mm -hmm. Class mm -hmm. D is I'm not sure I want to hang out here in the daytime. <laughs> With a flag jacket. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the property that we're refinancing today, we took yeah. from at best a C minus at oh, best. Yeah. yeah. Literally, there were gunshots while we were doing due diligence when one of our partners was in the parking lot at night driving, just checking things out. Uh, but we've taken that from, you know, at best C minus to now I would say B, B plus, and we're still going to continue doing renovations over the next year with funds from the refi to, you know, make it an even nicer property. Awesome. Awesome. So the next question I have for you then it's about people and my favorite thing about commercial real estate, I think it's because nobody's going to be all six sides of the die for any real amount of time. And we're always really eager to build more partnerships, give referrals to each other. And uh, I think that's really, really great. But at the same time, all of us are better suited to help some people more than others. Me personally, with all my tech and marketing, the sponsors and KPs are the people who I'm always looking for because they have to have some sort of foundation first before I can really disproportionately make a difference where I can really be adding fuel to the fire. Whereas like when you're first getting started, it's the grunts that you really need. You know, you have to put in the real effort and uh, like it doesn't matter how big your brain is, it's, you're not going to really make that big of an impact. But um, I don't know if you have any 506B deals going on. And if you do, you're not allowed to entice investors, whatever that means. But uh, as far as people who you're well suited to help, uh, who, who are you really looking for? Who can you help uh, more than others uh, in commercial real estate? Uh, Yaden, who should reach out? You know, it's funny because I, I love your 506B.me after this. I love that. I looked it up uh, from whatever call we were on the other day because mm -hmm. all of our stuff is 506B. Mm -hmm. Like we, we can't advertise any of our stuff, but I really love, I, I love that because we get to work with, uh, you know, what would be considered by Wall Street to be small time investors. But let me tell you something, the married couple that has $50,000 in their savings account, that's not a small investor. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's their life savings that they're putting somewhere and being able to work with regular people to get them the risk adjusted returns that's available with commercial real estate that really like i see right there on your screen help people who need it people need an opportunity to get a piece of an asset like this to get piece of of a deal like this to, to change their future so that's that's really what i'm we what i'm good at is finding investors walking them through how this works you know building that investor database that's that's what i love Mm -hmm. Great, man. Yeah, you got a fantastic uh, educational platform for that on Facebook. And uh, as far as how we ended up meeting, uh, like I know that we ran into each other a couple of times in Tim Bratz's uh, uh, mastermind. And, uh, and but as far as reaching out to me, I spend way more time on LinkedIn than I do on Facebook. And so that's a great way to reach out to me is to connect on, uh, on LinkedIn. But uh, I, I know you're more active on, uh, on Facebook, at least. I don't know if it's your primary platform for them, but uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and, and work with you, Yaden? Facebook is our primary platform, our, our large group, my first million in multifamily. It's easy to find. I'm easy to find on Facebook. You type my name in, there aren't but me and one other guy that I've found so far. You might find my dad first because he has his, his middle name is Yaden. But find me on Facebook, Yaden Smith. 
Uh, I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn, but you know, Facebook is my primary focus because that's where that's that's where the people that I can help seem to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Perfect. And the only other thing I have left is actually not for you, Yaden, it's for you in the audience, which is I, I've got this thing that I got to let you know about. It's a social awareness campaign. It's called uh, Get Rid of All the Ugly Red Buttons. And under my left hand, you'll notice that there might just in fact be a big ugly red button it says subscribe on it and if people walk by and they see it like you it's pretty embarrassing really like you don't want people to see that you see and all all you have to do to get rid of this red button is you click on it and then it turns gray and i call that the gray button of tranquility it's my favorite thing in the world and the reason for that is because it has a magical power the magical power is it means that youtube will start to pay for these videos instead of me which is better right but all jokes aside, really what it means, it's not going to ask you for your email address or credit cards or any of that silliness. What it really just means is that uh, my videos might show up on your list of suggestions, but you can go ahead and ignore them because I just appreciate you spending the time with me today. Just like Yaden, it's been fantastic getting to know you better. Thanks for uh, joining me today. Dan, thanks, brother. Appreciate it very much. Awesome. Make sure you 506B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506B me. Oh, hey, yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner? Okay, yeah, oh yeah, just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool, and now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay, are you already logged into 506 Me? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool, yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list, so when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat, real estate's a scam, that's really funny. Yeah. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me everybody.